Yeah. No. All right. Thank you all for coming. I want to go ahead and start us off with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our material for this afternoon. Let's go ahead and pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you have blessed us with, and Lord, we thank you for the people that are here in this room that have chosen to come and and to learn more about your word. And, and Lord, I pray that you'll please help us to um, just just talk with one another and, and figure out how we can help our, our teens and our young people grow uh, in you. Lord, I pray that you'll please help us to continue to grow as individuals and, and help us to know more and more what we need to do. And I just pray that you'll help us to study your word together and to learn together and always seek um, with everything we do to, to follow your will. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so before we get started, I want to go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Isaac May, and I am the youth minister here at the Creep Hall Church of Christ. So this is kind of my home right right around here. In fact, I live right across the street, so we're very, very close. Uh, I've been here for a little over two years now, and so we've loved our work here in Creep Hall, loved our work here in Nashville, and getting to be with all of you here at the Connect Conference the past couple of years has been a true blessing. And so me and Cliff Hand are kind of going to tag team this for a little bit, and he'll get up and he'll introduce himself here in just a little bit. But to start off, uh, our topic for this afternoon is difficult conversations that we need to have with our youth. So we're not going to have much time to be interactive and to ask a lot of questions throughout these topics that we're discussing. But I wanted to go ahead and ask you all from the very beginning, what are, in your opinion, some difficult, difficult topics that need to be addressed with our youth today. Purity. Purity. That's a really good one. I'm saying Bible authority when it comes to like gender issues, sexual issues, and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about a little bit about both of those today. What else? <laughs> uh, drug or drug temptation. Yeah. Yeah. Addictions. Yeah. Substance abuse. Very important. Suicide, very important. Mental health in general. Yeah, modesty and, and clothing. That's a really good one. Teaching our children to remain calm, keeping them safe. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and figuring out how we can do our, our best job and and helping them grow. Anything else? Okay, so we will cover some of those things that you guys have mentioned and, and others we may not get some, some time to discuss, but our goal today is to discuss topics that need to be addressed with our young people today, but for one reason or another, they just are not touched on enough. And this is not an extensive list of all the difficult topics that need to address. You all mentioned some things that we're just not going to have time to get to today. However, the goal is at least we can cover at least a few of the things that we believe need more attention than they are getting in our churches and in our families uh, right now. So our goal is not so much to tell you in depth how you might have these discussions as it is to tell you about the difficult topics and why they need to be addressed while giving a brief rundown of what that might look like. So in doing so, I'm going to share some of the dangers of not addressing these topics. And in other words, if our teens are not hearing these things, or these messages, what are some things that could happen? And so Cliff and I each have two to three topics that we're going to mention one at a time and why it is important to have these discussions. And I just want to go ahead and apologize at the very beginning. I'm going to be talking really fast because we have a lot of information to cover in a very short period of time. We were just talking about how each one of these topics could probably have an entire quarter spent on them. We're going to have about five to ten minutes per topic. So we're going to try to really fly through some of this information, and hopefully you all are able to follow along. But the first topic that we want to address together is, does God exist? This is something that uh, maybe you've heard several lessons on, maybe you haven't heard that much on at all. But the reason I think this is so important is that when you look at the different generations over years past and the current current generation, I think today's youth don't care as much about the what as they do about the why. I think that's what we're seeing more and more. There is a time where people really were very, very concerned with the truth. 
and that's all they wanted to know was the truth, the facts about that information. And I think our youth today know a lot about the truth, but what they're more interested in is why I need to know that truth. Now that I know that truth, what am I supposed to do with it, and why should I believe that truth? And so when we think about does God exist, I think the youth have been told their entire lives that God exists, and maybe they grew up in the church, and so it's just assumed that they should know this. But I think more importantly, the question that our youth have is why should I believe this? And why do you believe this? And what is this going to do for me? How is this going to change my life? So I want to talk about three things that we discussed a little bit last week. We just had church camp last week, and we discussed these three things in one of our Bible classes And I'll explain in just a little bit why I'm mentioning these three things. But raise your hand if you've heard of ethos, logos, and pathos. Okay, so these are different persuasive techniques that are used to persuade somebody about a product or about something that they should believe in. I'm going to give a very quick rundown of each of these things. So ethos is the ethical appeal, which means to convince an audience of the author's credibility or character. So commercials that are using ethos are those that have celebrities or professional athletes endorsing their product. So because these people are well known and respected, they establish credibility for the product. In other words, if LeBron James is in a Nike commercial, basketball players will see, well, LeBron James is wearing this, so that means I need to wear this. Or if Taylor Swift is uh, for an Apple Music commercial or several other things, they're establishing credibility through these different people. There are several different instances in scripture of gospels using ethos to establish Jesus credibility. Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says that all authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. And John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31, John is talking about, I am writing these things to you so that you may believe. And he writes all of these different things in the book of John. Jesus establishes his credibility through working miracles, casting out demons, fulfilling dozens of prophecies. And do you think that anybody would follow Jesus if he was not able to establish his authority with some of these things? And the answer is probably not. And so you see ethos used. When you think about logos, logos is the appeal to logic, which means to convince an audience by use of logic or reason. So commercials using logos is going to be talking about statistics, facts, or history to construct logical arguments. So if you think about the Flex Seal commercials, they talk about Flex Seal, and then they show you how it works. And so when we're talking about our faith, there are several things that appeal to our logic as reasons to believe in God and the Bible. You can talk about how the Bible makes 2,500 prophecies, and not a single one of those have been wrong so far. You talk about how the Bible is written in 40 different authors over 1,500 years in three different languages over three different continents, and yet we don't see a single contradiction in that Bible. You could talk about how the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, or the moral argument show evidence pointing towards the existence of God. And then finally, you have pathos. This is the emotional appeal, which means to persuade an audience by appealing to their emotions. So commercials that use pathos are those that try to tug on your heartstrings so that you will buy their products. For example, a dog rescue shelter. They're going to show images of a dog that's hurting and is very sad and needs your help so that you will adopt them. In the Bible, we see pathos used a lot. You don't have to go much farther than John 3.16 and Romans 5, 7 through 8 to see that God sent his only son to die on the cross for our sins while we were still sinners, as Romans 5 through 8 says. God loves us so much that he chose to create us. Jesus loved us so much that he was willing to to die for us so that we can be in heaven with him. Now, why am I bringing all this up? 1 Peter 3, verse 15 says, Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, but with gentleness and respect. When I was a freshman at Ohio State, I spent a couple years there before going to Creed Hardman. When I was at Ohio State, there was one night that I was at Waffle House with three of my roommates, Uh, I spent a lot of nights at Waffle House, but on this particular night, I was with my three roommates. They were random roommates. I didn't know them going in. They weren't members of the church. And I remember one of those nights, one of my roommates asked me at Waffle House, why do you believe in God? And this was something I was not prepared to answer at the time. It's not that I didn't know why I had believed, but I was not prepared to make a defense. I was not prepared to answer that question at that time. I want you to consider if somebody asks you why you believe in God, what would you say? Do you have something that you know you would be able to tell them to explain to them why you believe in God? 
if you want to have a meaningful conversation about whether or not God exists, you need to be able to share why you personally believe in God. Which of these three things that we talked about appeal to you the most? Is it the the ethos, the credibility behind the Bible? Is it the logos, the logic, how it just makes more sense than anything else? Is it the pathos? Is it the emotional appeal behind it that persuades you to believe that God exists? You need to share these things with the teenagers. Whether you're a parent, whether you're a youth worker, or just a, a mentor to these teens, you need to share these things with them. And that is going to mean so much more than just giving them the cold, hard facts. Why do you believe what you believe? And how have you seen God personally work in your life? And what are some reasons that they can have to believe that as well? So just a couple things to remember when having this conversation before I toss it over to Cliff for the next thing. Number one, it's okay to doubt. Don't shame the teenagers for doubting and be able to share your personal experiences of times that you may have doubted to help them work through that doubt and get to a point where they can have full assurance in their faith. Number two, are they actually questioning their belief in God or are they just frustrated with God's people? Because it's very easy to be upset with God's people and instead project that onto one's belief in God. And number three, remember to listen, listen, and listen more. Because as much as you can tell them, unless you're willing to listen to them and what they have to say, they're not going to be able to take that belief and make it their own. Cliff's going to bring us our second topic. All right, my name is Cliff Hand. I'm the youth minister at the Hilldale Church of Christ up in Clarksville. Uh, taking uh, Keith O'Neill's spot uh, this week, he has had a, a great opportunity to uh, continue to do some good things with some schools down in Florida. Uh, so thank you for allowing me to be here. All right, so we want to continue our, our thought process of why do we have these conversations, these classes about these things that are hard, that are tough, that are difficult. Isaac did a fantastic job of, of introducing us to why. I remember 20, 25 years ago, and yes, I'm aging myself, when I was in a youth group member, we had to go through these very rigorous processes with parents and guardians about before we could even learn about some of these things. I remember being held out of a Bible class because my parents didn't want me to sit on the class talking about abortion. Not because they agreed with abortion, but because they just didn't think that I was old enough to deal with those type of serious topics. Look, if, if we as families and the church are not having these discussions, whether at home or in these Bible classes, somebody is teaching them somewhere already. Okay, with the amount of information that is widely available all over the place, young people are learning about these things earlier and earlier and earlier. We're talking about kindergartners, first graders, preschoolers are having conversations with their friends at school, some even teachers who feel like they need to fill our young people's heads with things, of things that are incorrect, things that push them away from God, things that make them feel like there are other things out there that are better or more interesting than God. So I encourage you before we jump into this, this next topic is if you are not having these conversations as parents with your children at home, youth ministers, ministers, Bible class teachers, if you are not trying to figure out a way to do it in an appropriate way at your churches, we really want to encourage you to do that. Uh, one of the topics that I'm going to be talking about is one that we have all asked. Why is there suffering? Why is there suffering? Okay, And why do we need to answer this question? Because we all will, in some way, form or fashion, have a form of suffering. We will go through something that makes us feel like we are suffering. Whether it's a, the loss of a loved one, personal illness, or just the way we feel about the way we see the world is going, how much evil and stuff there is out there, we all have to deal with it. So we need to figure out what do we need to do to help prepare ourselves to answer this question. Why does it exist in the first place? There are a lot of ways to answer that question. Lots of ways to answer that question. The problem is, and we have to be up front and have to admit that we don't always like the answers. God knows everything. God created everything. God has this big plan in motion that we don't always understand all the time. And He has answers for things 
that sometimes end up being those answers, young people that our parents say that we don't like? Well, because I said so. Because this is the way that it is. And so when we have these conversations, it's going to be hard for some people to hear something that they don't like the answer to. That doesn't mean the answer is any less truthful. How many of you remember the picture that was going around the internet some years ago about the, the dress that was either blue and black or gold and white? How many of you guys remember that? Okay. All right. So you want to know what the answer to that question is? All right. Hang, hang on. How many of you believed it was blue and black? You know, I know it's been a while. How many of you gold and white? I know it's been a long time ago. It's a picture. Look it up later. Okay. The correct answer or the person who originally took the picture is that the answer is that it is blue and black. Now, there are a lot of people who are still up in arms and still periodically pop up on social media. You're still angry that that is the correct answer, but that's the right answer. But their perception was is that it was something different. And so we're not always going to like our answers to the question. Why is suffering? Number one, God created free will. None of us would want to be controlled completely. Those of you young people in here, you don't want your parents to be able to control every action of every day, everything you say, everything you do. That would just, it would be awful. It would be horrible. And God did not create us in that way. He gave us an amazing free will. And our free will is what brought sin and suffering and all those awful things into the world. We now live in that fallen world. People don't like that answer. Okay, It's not an easy answer to accept, but we have to understand that God did not create a world of sin and suffering, but we, given free will, okay, as human beings, okay, though we are not perfect, we have brought sin and suffering into the world. At about 300-ish B.C., there was a Grecian philosopher whose name I will butcher, so I'm not going to say it, but I'm going to give you some, some thoughts on what he had to say. He said this, Is God willing to prevent evil, but not able? Well, then He's not omnipotent. Is He able, but not willing? Well, then He's malevolent. If He's both willing and able, then whence comes evil? If He is neither able nor willing, then why call Him God? You see, way back when, about 2,300 years ago, they were trying to, number one, get rid of God, disprove this all-powerful, all-knowing all God because of this idea of evil and suffering. But what we have to do is when we follow down through this idea of this logic, okay, when we think about God existing and God creating and God being so good, okay, God is good, God is love, all of these things, did God create a world of evil and suffering? No. God did not create a world of evil and suffering. We brought that evil and suffering into this world. Um, our free will does, however, give us the opportunity to escape the evil and the suffering, but we will have to endure it for a little while. But we still will have to make the right choices in order to be able to escape it. We'll talk about that more in the, in the second uh, topic that I'm going to talk about in just a minute. Um, I did, recently did a study with our young people, and I'm going to try to hurry a little faster. A study that's called It's Not About Me. Uh, and one particular chapter that we looked at was called My Struggles Are About Him. And this is probably one of the bigger questions that they're going to have about suffering than it is about the fact that there's suffering out there, but why do I suffer? Why, why do I go through these hard things? Um, does suffering exist because God is mad? And the answer to that is no. Psalms 103 Beginning in verse 8, it says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the loving kindness toward those who fear Him. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you, and will, you will honor me. God is not angry, and therefore suffering exists. Uh, it's not an, an easy thing for us to follow, especially to think about the blind man that Jesus comes in contact with on the side of the road. I'm going to talk about him real quick and turn it right back over to Isaac. Okay, you guys remember in John chapter 9, Jesus encounters the blind man, and his apostles say this in, in verse number 1 of chapter 9 of John. As he passed by, he saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he would be born blind? And Jesus answered, it was neither that this man 
sin nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Okay, in, in your homes and in your offices and in your rooms, I'm sure that you all have some things displayed on a shelf, in a picture frame, okay, on, on some kind of pedestal. What does the, the shelf, the frame, and the pedestal all have in common? They are displaying something that is of value to you. That is our job. Okay, That was the job of this uh, blind man. His job that Jesus told him was that he was blind so that my power would be shown. My glory would be shown. He, if he could have picked any other job that God was handing out, I'm sure he would have picked it. You think Peter gets to preach the first sermon, Mary gets to be mother of Jesus, and you, you're going to be blind for me. No, wait, no, no thanks. You can imagine that, that going on. But we have a similar thing given to us in our life. How we deal with the suffering that comes in our lives will either show God's glory or show how much we actually despise God. Because we don't trust what He says to be true, that He's going to take care of us. That things are going to be better past this physical life. It's not easy to be the person who God's glory has to be seen through your suffering. Um, my dad, when he was diagnosed with cancer, and he was told that he was not going to live, instead of questioning God and asking why, spent his last few days asking every doctor, every nurse, everybody who passed by, if they knew who God was. And if they didn't, he directed them to the Scripture, lets them know that God loved them and He loved them too. How do you deal with the suffering that you've got going on in your life? Suffering exists because mankind brought it in. God didn't bring it in. How we deal with that suffering Okay, that will make a difference between how people see God as either a loving God who's going to take care of us or a God who despises us and forsakes us. Okay, so before I get to my next topic, I just want to mention that uh, for Cliff and I both, I'm sure a lot of this information that we're covering, if you want to know more information on those, we each, I'm sure, have several helpful books, articles, whatever that could be used uh, in, in the future that's more than just a five to ten minute rundown of these things. The next two things that I'm going to cover are kind of in a, in a two-part um, series on sexuality and a godly look at sexuality. And the first part that I'm going to talk before I pass it over to Cliff is going to be about a godly view of sex in the Bible. And when we talk about some of these topics that are difficult to talk about, I think some of them are difficult because we just don't know as much information about them. Or it's just harder to know the answers to these questions. I think when we think about a godly view of sex, this is a, a difficult topic to talk about because it's awkward, it's uncomfortable. And so because of this, we just try to avoid it altogether and, and don't talk about some of these things. And when we do talk about uh, some of these things, I think we frame that in, in the uh, mindset of purity, or we frame that when we're talking about, we brought up modesty, when we're talking about modesty, we frame it in the idea of you should not be wearing these types of clothes and this is why. And when we talk about sex, we talk about you should not be participating in these things and this is why. And those are important truths that need to be communicated. But when those are the only truths that are communicated, we're giving unhealthy views of different things. We're giving an unhealthy view of sex in general. And we're also, when we're saying in modesty, the only thing we're communicating is that we shouldn't be wearing these clothes. And we're giving both girls and guys an unhealthy view of, of the body that God has given them. And so these things need to be addressed, but they need to be addressed in a healthy biblical way. And so when you think about when is biblically appropriate sex going to be taught, if not for in the church, and if not within our own families and our own homes, then where and when are they going to hear about it? And the, the answer is, if, if you don't teach it, if it's not being taught in the church and in the homes, then they're going to be forced to find it somewhere else. And I promise you that when they are forced to find it somewhere else, they're not getting that biblically appropriate view of those things. So if you want to teach biblical sex in a healthy way, I want you to think about the book of Song of Solomon a book that is used, one of, or if not, the least used book in the Bible. The Song of Solomon makes Revelation look like it's an everyday topic. 
because we just don't talk about it very much. Uh, I had a professor at Freed Hardeman that jokes that his wife still doesn't let him read the Song of Solomon. And so the, the fact of the matter is, this is a book of the Bible that God has given us for a very specific reason. If God thought it was important enough to be in the canon of His Scripture, then it's a, it's a book that we should probably look at and study it. And if we want to teach biblical sex in a healthy way, we can do that from the book of Song of Solomon with breaking it down into its different chapters. And when you break it down, this is what you, uh, this is what you see. Number one, you see that this begins with an attraction between a man and a woman. Just like dating, when you begin to date somebody, this begins with an attraction between a man and a woman. And as they continue to date, as you see in Song of Solomon, and grow closer to one another, they share more of themselves with each other. As they grow closer with each other, they become more attracted sexually to each other, and teens need to know that that attraction is okay. That if this is a relationship between a man and a woman, then this is going to happen, but restraint needs to be practiced when thinking about this. It is okay to desire after a gift from God, but the sin comes in when we no longer show restraint to practice sex in the ways that God has prescribed. If you continue to read through the book, you see uh, the wedding and you see that they get to take part in this gift after marriage. And then you see uh, in chapter 5 a little bit of a fight or maybe some tension that starts to grow be between this couple. And as they move through this, you see the continued romance and the coming back together despite this tension. And eventually you see this commitment to each other and praise to God. And finally, the book ends with a permanent love for one another based around their relationship and their love for God. And so while if you're teaching this to teenagers, maybe you take out some of those middle chapters. I think it's so important that they hear this message. And there are several consequences of not teaching sex in a, a biblically healthy way. There are two ways that we can incorrectly talk about sex. Number one is by teaching that it is wrong. And number two, it is by not teaching it at all. When we think about the first thing, sex is a blessing from God, and it is a gift that he has allowed married couples to take part in. This has to be communicated with our teens. If you are only teaching the negatives of sex, then teens will grow up to have an unhealthy view of marital sex, and they will seek to find the good in it elsewhere. If they're only hearing the negatives from the church and from their own families, but they're hearing the positives about it in the world and in media and everywhere else, and they're going to look to that media to try to find out for themselves where those positives exist, and that's not what we want. Number two, if you're not teaching at all, every time you choose to not teach about something, you are teaching them that it is either not important or that it is wrong. So if you do not teach about a healthy view of sex, then they are going to find it somewhere else that I mentioned. They're going to find the world's view on sex, which is far from the blessing that God has given us. So when we want to remember some things uh, when having these conversations, three things that we need to remember. Number one, have the conversation. Have those conversations with your teens and, and do it in a way that is as the Bible has prescribed. And don't just do it once, but make it a continuous conversation so it can be an honest discussion with your teenager. Number two, teach it as a blessing from God when it is used in the ways that God has prescribed. Because that's what it is. It's a gift from God given to his children as long as it's used according to the ways that he has prescribed. And number three, remind them that it is never too late to desire sexual integrity. So if this has been lost in the past, that doesn't mean that all hope is lost, but it's never too late to try to pick up that sexual integrity and find that again. Have these conversations with our teens, despite how awkward and uncomfortable it is, and I promise you it will be much, much better than them finding these views and opinions from the world. <clears throat> All right. Is there really heaven and hell? Do those places actually exist? Are there rewards and punishments at the end of life? Uh, it's a question that we want to ask and we, we ask because we just we don't know. We're unsure. Should I continue to do what I'm supposed to do? Does it matter what I do? Because there are a lot of 
places and people who teach that, yes, there's right and there's wrong, but even God kind of overlooks and gives maybe an overabounding amount of grace uh, that maybe what we should ascribe to God, that hell is not really someplace that anybody is going to end up. And so you have to have these this conversation about that these are real places that God does talk about and especially Christ talk about. So the best place to start with talking about these is go directly to the mouth of Jesus. And I'm going to go over just a handful of these with you very quickly. If you'd like the handout that's got them all listed, I've got some with me today. Uh, I do want to say kind of as uh, uh, just with all transparency, uh, Isaac and I got some of our information today from Keith who did a fantastic series on this with his uh, young people, his congregation. Uh, so we were able to take some of the stuff that he said and add it with some of our own. So if you are interested uh, in more about some of these lessons in a lot more uh, deep than we have been able to bring them to you today, let us know and we'll get you in touch with him. Uh, so Jesus says several things about this. In John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions or uh, probably a better translation are many dwelling places or many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, Jesus said, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. John 3 and verse 13, No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven, do not, excuse me, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And we could go on and on, and for time's sake, and also for your attention span in this warm room, we won't go over them all, I won't read them to you, okay? Uh, but Jesus has a lot to say about this. And it's important for us to understand that he's not just saying about these these very descriptive places of both reward and punishment as just a way to try to keep us in line. These are very real and he's trying to warn his disciples, he's trying to warn us that we need to be thinking about eternity in the, the realm of heaven and hell. There's, there's not an in-between, okay? Uh, Jesus tells us that in Revelation. Okay, uh, So uh, let me go back over here real quick. There are two kinds of people in the end. This is what C.S. Lewis says. There are, or excuse me, those who say to God, thy will be done. And then those to whom God says, thy will be done. We're either going to be the people who God says, or that we say to God that we want to do His will, we want to follow what He says, or we're going to be the people that God has said, okay, do what you want. God has given us free wills, we talked about already, and we hope that we have decided to follow what He says so that we can take part in heaven and not in hell. Uh, people usually want to ask about, is there really heaven and hell? Because of this big idea that we've talked about already, God is so loving, and God has so much grace, and God, he just, he just pours out His love. I mean, He sent His Son for us, for crying out loud. Why would, we, why would there be a hell? Why is that even necessary? Does God want us to go there? See, we have a choice because that these places do exist. First of all, John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. We all know what those say. God loved this world so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever should believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. He doesn't want anybody to perish. Jesus was sent so that we hopefully would not perish, but we still have to receive the gift. On and on the scriptures talk about this amazing gift of God, and we all know how gifts work. 
uh, amazing lesson last Thursday night at the Southern Hills uh, Congregation, part of the Summer Youth Series. Um, uh, T.J. Kirk talked about, explained to us how this whole idea of a gift this gift works. Okay, we know how that if I give you something, you have an option to either take it and open it or refuse it. And that's exactly what God gives to us. He gives us a gift and we have to choose it. We can take it, open it, be a part of his grace or we can refuse. Deuteronomy chapter 30. I'm going to read this real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 30 beginning in verse 15. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways and to keep His commandments and His statutes and His judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying His voice, and by holding fast to Him, for this is your life and the length of your days that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Heaven is real. Hell is real. Only one was truly created for us. Okay? The other one, the other one happens to be there. Okay? It was not made for, for us. God doesn't want us to go. He doesn't condemn us there. But if we don't follow him, then that's that's where we have a danger of ending up. And I don't know that we say that enough. I'll say this real quick and turn it right back over to Isaac. I think he's got one more. He's going to try to squeeze in here. Okay, not long ago, probably the tail end of, of my being little, and some of your congregations may still do this. Hellfire and brimstone was the way to go. Okay, that got people's attention. It made them understand. It made them listen that you needed to follow God, you needed to do what He said, or hell was very real and you were going to burn. Okay? Now, are those things true that they said? Absolutely. Okay? But we also know that in today's world, with our young people, and even not our young people, who are listening to the, the prosperity of, of grace, okay, we have to let them know that it is a place, it does exist, it is real, Okay, they need to be told about it and not just kind of let it go. We can't go the complete opposite direction of the way that those our former uh, members of the church did. We have to, we have to preach it, we have to teach it, we have to talk about it. We need to understand it, but we don't necessarily have to do it in such an intense way where we forget the love that comes along with it. Okay, all right, Isaac. Okay, so our last topic we're going to be talking about, I mentioned earlier that it's kind of a two-part of, of godly sexuality. And the second part that I want to discuss very briefly is that of homosexuality. And I want to start off giving a few statistics. The most recent Gallup poll shows that 5.6% of Americans identify as LGBTQ. This number rose 1% in five years from 2012 to 2017 and has risen 1.1% in just the last three years. 15.9% of those in Generation Z, that's those born from 1997 to 2002, identify as LGBTQ. In other words, that number is 10% higher than the average population when you look at all the generations in the past. And the percentage of those who are accepting of homosexuality in the United States has increased from 51% to 72% since 2002, a rise of over 20% in less than 20 years. So what's the point of bringing up these statistics? This is a growing topic in the United States. This is something that is talked about more and more and more and is becoming more and more popular. So it's a topic that has to be addressed in the church as well. I'm going to spend very briefly telling you what the Bible says about the topic of homosexuality. There are at least five different scriptures that directly condemn homosexuality. On top of that, the teachings of Jesus, their creation narrative, and the qualifications of elders and deacons 
all mention a male-female relationship. Now, if you're able to explain away all of those things, all those verses condemning homosexuality, if you're able to explain away the teachings of Jesus, the creation narrative, and the qualifications of elders and deacons, the bottom line is that there is not one single example given in Scripture of an acceptable homosexual relationship. Yet from beginning to end, there is man and woman, husband and wife language. With all that being said, I think our teens know the what. As I talked about at the beginning of class, I think they know that homosexuality is wrong. They've been told this. They've been taught this. But what a lot of teenagers don't know is why. And how am I supposed to address homosexuality in society today? Because more and more friends, more and more people at my school are, are dealing with this. So how do I address that on a daily basis? So number one, what if there is a teenager who is struggling with homosexuality? There are five things that you need to communicate to them. Number one, they are not alone. There are probably so many others who are dealing with this on a daily basis that they have no idea about because it's not something that we talk about very often. Number two, if they are not acting on it, then they are no worse off. As I talked about earlier, just because there is a desire or a temptation, if you don't act on that, then that doesn't mean that you're committing that sin. Number three, find a support system and an accountability partner where you can share these things with and openly communicate these things with them. Number four, listen to God's word more than the media because the media is trying to portray a very different message than what God's word is trying to tell us. And number five, that desire, that temptation, whatever it may be, is not worth losing eternity over. And so never let that take over your life. Finally, I want to close with uh, if you're having this conversation with a teenager, how to address homosexuality in today's culture. And this is what I think is more important because, again, I think people have had it pounded into them their whole lives that homosexuality is wrong, but they don't know what to do with that information. And because of that, the church has gotten a really bad view from society and from culture based on how we treat others with hom that are dealing with homosexuality. Number one, we have to understand the sin. We have to stop seeing People in this community are so different. Several of the passages, uh, these five passages, uh, have homosexuality listed among several other sins. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 15, lists a long line of sins. One of those sins, homosexuality being listed with liars. So if we're looking at this, this community as so much different and so much worse than anybody else, take a look at the rest of that list and ask yourself if you've ever struggled with one of those things. We have to stop treating it like it's so much worse. They have grown so much in part because that community is so welcoming and we cannot push others away from the church because we refuse to be welcoming. Rather than being harsh and judgmental, remember to be kind and understanding. Number two, we can't trivialize the sin. This means making something seem less important, significant, or complex than it really is. So we can't make jokes or make rude comments. You never know who may be struggling with this, so don't be the one to push them away. Number three, we cannot endorse the sin. Hopefully, we've made it clear that homosexuality is a sin and against the design laid out by the Word of God. If we accept, support, or endorse what they are doing, we are standing opposed to the Word of God. Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 32 talks about how this is a sin and then talks about how some people not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And that is equally as opposing to God's word. If you stand opposed to the world, you'll be bullied, you may be canceled, you may be rejected, and it may cost you some very dear friends, but it will be worth it. Because I would rather be rejected by men and women all the days of my life than be rejected by God in the end. And finally, number four, we have to love the sinner. God has sent his son for all the world and desires for all to be saved. So shouldn't we love all of those around us regardless of their spiritual state? And shouldn't we show love even more to those who do not know the love of God? Now you may say, wouldn't love mean supporting them no matter who they are and supporting what makes them happy? But wouldn't you rather them be with you in eternity than to have your acceptance right now? When we think about Jesus and the adulterous woman, how the, the people brought this adulterous woman, a woman who's caught in adultery to Jesus, and they put her before his midst and asked what they should do with him. Jesus did not say, you're right, let's go ahead and stone this woman for what she's done. He did not condemn her. 
He did not reject or shun her. He did not trivialize her sin or make fun of her. And he did not accept her lifestyle. But instead, he showed her love. He forgave her for her past. And he encouraged her to sin no more. And this is the approach we should take when we're dealing with people in the LGBTQ community. I'm going to close with this quote. This is from Matthew Vines, who is a homosexual and the leader of the Reformation Project. This is a project that's trying to get homosexuality back in our churches today. This is what he said, and I think it's so important to us today. He said, but regardless of your views, I encourage you to build meaningful relationships with the LGBTQ Christians, to walk in our shoes, and to make space for us in your churches and homes. As important as theology is, when the church has caused this much pain and suffering to a group of people, our first response should be repentance and sacrificial love. How have we acted or treated others in the past, and how do we need to change that in the future? All these topics that we talked about today have been very, very quick. And again, if if there's any additional information that we can provide you with, I, I know Cliff and I would both be more than more than happy to give that information to you. And again, I want to reiterate that this is not an extensive list, that there's so many other things that we could have mentioned. There's so many other things that we could have talked about. But these five things that we talked about today, I highly encourage you to begin talking about those things with your teenagers. Whether you have kids of your own, whether you're a mentor or a helper, these are things that they need to hear because if they don't hear them from us, then they're going to hear them from the world. And that's not where we want them to get our information from. So I hope that you guys have appreciated this. We appreciate you guys being here and listening. I'm going to ask Cliff to come and, and lead us in a word of prayer to close. If you don't mind. Let's bow. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time spent together today to be able to discuss some of these, these difficult things. Uh, we know that uh, not only our young people, but our, 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 our members and, and those who come to us looking for answers are asking these hard questions. Uh, Father, help us to continue to be learning, to be growing. Uh, to show love to all those who ask these questions so that we might be able to not show them us, not show them our knowledge, but show them you. Father, we're thankful for this conference. We ask that you continue to bless it as it continues the rest of this weekend. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you all.